Uh, on behalf of the economics department, I'm happy to have Misha here presenting with us for uh, economics and public policy in the real world. Uh, Misha and I go back all the way to grad school when uh, we were stuck together in uh, those grad school offices together. Um, yeah, I don't know what else, uh, what else do I have to say here? Um, for the presentation, I guess, a bit of housekeeping. Just uh, unless Misha wants to change anything with this, I'll uh, monitor the chat if anything comes in. But by far and large, again, unless Misha wants something different, uh, we could uh, maybe hold questions to the end. And we'll definitely have some room at the end there for a bit of a question and answer period. Uh, Misha, if there's anything you can want to add, otherwise I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Keith. So first off, I want to say the only reason I made it through grad school was because of Keith. So you guys have an excellent, excellent instructor because uh, I owe not flunking out of grad school to Keith's knowledge of matrix algebra, which he very generously shared with the rest of us. So that's kind of a fun aspect of reflecting on the time. So what we're going to do is let's keep it casual. We're not a massive crowd, so I've got a bunch of time saved at the end for Q&A because these sorts of discussions can really, I think, benefit from being very back and forth because we can tune in specifically what you're interested in, the specific questions you have. But what I've provided here as sort of a, of a, of a talk is just sort of a primer to, to wet that discussion at the end based on what you might be interested in, whether it's on the economic side or on the public policy side, and we can feed into that. So let's jump right into it and say, okay, economics and public policy. You've read some textbooks, maybe you've, you've interned or worked in some fields, but how are decisions made at the higher levels? How are laws formed? How does policy evolve? How do all those things interact with economic fundamentals? And that's what we'll run through today. But I always like to preface these discussions by saying, why do we even care? Like, uh, what's the big deal? And I think it's best captured by the 1995 Nobel Prize economics winner, a guy named Robert Lucas, who specifically said, is there some action that would lead the Indian economy to grow like Indonesia's or Egypt's? If so, what exactly? The consequences for human welfare involved in questions like these are simply staggering. And once one starts to think about them, it is hard to think about anything else. And if you really take a second to mull that over, it is quite stark and quite dramatic. I moonlight as an instructor at Northwestern, and when I teach the class there in terms of applied stats and applied quantitative methods, one of the things we focus on is the cost of these sorts of interventions. Now, Lucas is speaking specifically to a, a point in time, almost 30 years ago, where there was a lot of growth in these various economies and some were behaving very differently than others. But it doesn't have to be that abstract. If you just take Chicago, where Northwestern University is, and you look at the rate of violent crime and you compare it to New York, another large American city, and you look at the parallel paths that they followed, and then when those paths diverged in terms of different public policies that were enacted, and you just take the murder rate and how it changed between the two places or didn't change, and you start cumulatively adding that up, you can get to thousands and thousands and thousands of lives saved just within one municipality based on pulling certain public policy levers. And if you think about all of the, the heartbreak and human suffering, other sorts of things that were avoided because of making smarter choices, that can be quite compelling. And I think that's the point that we wanna focus on is when you're thinking about public policy and you're thinking about economics, what can you do and how do you be careful about unintended consequences? And really remember that the implications for human welfare are simply staggering in these cases. And we are all benefiting from good public policy that was enacted a generation or two or prior to that right now in our respective areas. But there's also areas where our lives are worse because people pursued or didn't pursue the right public policy in the past. So that's what I want you to sort of mull over as we go through all of these various pieces. In terms of running through it, what we'll roughly cover is first, first I'm gonna give you a quick primer on the overall policy making process in the US. That's where my background is. So this will be a very US centric course in terms of discussing how public policy works. Even though I'm originally from British Columbia, I've spent my entire professional career in the U.S., so that's where my knowledge is, and that's what you're going to get. For better or for worse, uh, your career 
may or may not bring you down here, but this at least gives you a, an insight of that. So we're going to first do a crash course on the way that all public policy sort of works down here. Then we'll go through some market fundamentals, which sort of cues up the Econ 101 story of markets and, and how they work and how they fail, because that's really where you get the interaction between public policy and economics. And then we will sort of run through a couple of specific industries, healthcare, housing, energy, and environment, and then labor markets. So that's what we'll do. And then I've saved some time for wrap up and Q&A at, at the very back end. Before we get to all that, just a few words about myself. So I'm currently the chief economist for a tech company. We're headquartered in Denver, but we've got people all over. We sort of have dual headquarters in New York and the company itself is a two-sided marketplace, which means we serve both buyers and sellers on the market. In this case, it is for home services. So if you have your kitchen remodeled or you need a plumber or any of those sorts of things, that's the company that we specifically run. Before this, I was the chief economist and economic policy advisor to the governor of Illinois. So I was based out of Chicago, but spent a lot of time in Springfield, Illinois, the state capital. Before that, I was the deputy director of the Illinois Department of Commerce. Before that, I was a legislative director for the United States Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, I also moonlight as an applied quantitative analysis and statistics instructor at Northwestern University, which is in Evanston, just north of Chicago. But my background is in economics and political science, and I specifically did that at the University of Victoria, just up the street from all of you. Uh, what does any of this sort of look like? I think this is sort of the, the setup for maybe some fun Q&A at the end. What does it look like working for Congress? I specifically worked on science and infrastructure and financial services policy. Those are sort of the three things I focused on. Science policy was the one that was the most fun, and I got to be pretty involved in that community. So you can see this is hanging out with Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, because we were pretty active on science funding. And obviously, this is the capital building, if you're unfamiliar, behind. Overall, what was the day-to-day -day like of the job? If you ever watch C-SPAN, the American channel that sort of shows the proceedings of government, I was one of these staffers sitting behind the members of Congress that you see wondering what the heck they're doing. Well, I was one of those people. Uh, obviously, you got to schmooze with some, some more high-profile political figures. Uh, Barack Obama and I arrived in D.C. the exact same year. I think he made a little bit more of his time there than I did, but uh, we, we both uh, arrived at the same time. And then I uh, also got to do some neat international things. So this is me on a congressional trip to, to, uh, to Taiwan to uh, be at their, the head of their... Uh, government in Taipei. And then uh, this is at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. What does the state look like? So this is an interesting distinction in terms of the way policymaking works at the state. The legislative branch of the US government is seated in Congress. And so you spend a lot of time thinking about deep ideas, but you don't spend a lot of time actually thinking about running things, right? There's a, there's a loose oversight policy that, that Congress has, but really things are run by the executive branch. I got to experience the executive branch at the state level, which was a lot of fun. So this is the seat of the Illinois government. This is the Illinois state capitol. My office was just here right behind this tree in the capitol. It was a, a very, very interesting time to be there. You can see there's the Lincoln statue up front. This is the land of Lincoln. Lincoln started his political career in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, I got to do some, some fun administrative things because when you're running in your, when you're in the executive branch of a state government, there's a lot more administration and running and day-to-day -day policy implementation, and states also work a lot faster. This was something that took a lot of adjustment for me to figure out because I was almost 10 years working for Congress before I went to work for the state. And the time working for Congress, you can sort of think about an idea, and it takes like 10 or 20 years for something to sort of manifest through all of its different pieces before it usually becomes law. There are exceptions to that, but usually it takes a very, very long time, whereas at the state level of policymaking, it can happen very, very quickly. So something can be an idea and then it can be on the governor's desk for, for signature or veto within weeks or months. So it happens a lot more quickly. The other thing is, of course, the federal the structure of federalism in the US is a little bit more pronounced than it is in Canada. The states really do have more autonomy than say the provinces do in Canada. And as a result, you are kind of a quasi state actor in that sort of bigger capital version of the word in the sense that you do think more about trade arrangements and attracting foreign direct investment or you know trying to boost your export market and all of the things that you would know, typically associate with a national government but in the US the states do have more autonomy than than most regional governments in other countries so you can see one fun example of that here's me and then 
Uh, there's the governor at the time, and then there's Prime Minister Trudeau, who was there on a, on a trade mission to specifically look about it. And so this is one of those those fun aspects of doing a state government. And uh, I will shamelessly point out that Trudeau and I have matching matching ish socks, but he's actually wearing some space socks. And uh, just like Obama accomplished more with his time in office than I did, I would like to say my, my uh, popularity has not declined as much as Trudeau's since this picture was taken. Granted, he started from a much higher baseline, but this was certainly a, a fun, uh, fun aspect of the job. So let's jump into the actual sort of content and meat of the matter now that I've sort of provided some, some background on it. <clears throat> How do you view every public policy debate in the US? And I would say you can really boil it down to thinking about five different parts of every single policy debate that comes up. The first is who are the private stakeholders? So who are the individual actors in the economy? These can be any form of nonprofit government organization. It can be a trade association. It can be a labor union. It can be a private business or a collection of private businesses. It can be any one of those ranges. Then who are the public stakeholders, which can also mean uh, variations of that, but typically their revenue is more closely tied to the public dollar. Then you want to think about what are the authorizing statutes. So what are the big parts of statutory law that authorize or shape the policy around what you're allowed to talk about and, and how a specific system is set up? Then who are the oversight committees in your legislative body? And this is true federal or state. They're structured differently, but it's true in either way. And then what are the major authorizing agencies that scope the regulatory law that oversees these things. So I want you to hold those five different sort of pieces of every single debate in the back of your head as we sort of cruise through some of these examples of issues. To set up the example, the exa the, the uh, example areas of public policy and economics, let's jump into, first off, the root of economics. So what are the benefits of a perfect market? Because in econ, we're kind of given this story of how markets work and the benefits of them. So specifically, we have the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics, which guarantees that any competitive equilibrium is parito optimal, meaning that you cannot improve somebody else's stake without, imp without not improving somebody else's. So what does that mean? It means that if you and I are trading the Pareto optimal solution, we've both maximized all of our gains before we get into some, uh, you know, before we get into sort of diminishing returns for one of us. And the reason why we sort of care about this is because the Econ 101 story is that markets are the best way to maximize all human welfare. In this story of general equilibrium, where you have supply and demand for every single thing in the market, every single good, every single service, every single constituent part of both, there's this optimized equilibrium world where that all equalizes, scarcity is reduced, welfare is maximized. But it requires a bunch of assumptions in order to be true, in order for this story that we learn about in economics to be true. And the story isn't actually true in real life. We can get close to it. There are certain markets that work very, very well, but they're still not perfect. And there's a couple of assumptions that I kind of want to highlight that we rely on to tell this story about perfect markets. The first is we have to assume that nobody has pricing power. So it means that any individual actor can't actually shape the market price. The market price is strictly a consensus mechanism where individuals are perfectly equipped to answer or to, to enter the market and get their the market price without being able to shape it. That's true for buyers, it's true for sellers. So it means that no individual buyer can go out there and shape the market. And it means that no individual seller can go out there and shape the market price. So that's one big thing. And obviously that's not true. If you have either a monopoly or a monopsony or an oligopoly, you can run up to issues where individual actors can in fact shape the power, uh, or can in fact shape the market price. The second thing is perfect entry and exit. This is another one of these things where it assumes that uh, people can just sort of enter a market or leave the market. But if you throw a bunch of capital at building a factory to enter a market, A, you're not entering it perfectly. You have to go out and find all the capital and get people who are convinced that they'll get a return and then go out and deal with all of the hurdles and backlogs and delays to build a factory. And then once you've done that, you can't necessarily exit the market because you're supposed to get a return on that capital. So the perfect entry and exit is also limited. And this is also true on an individual level too. The labor market, which we'll talk about, is a market where there's employers and employees and, and it's a market for buying and selling your labor, but you need to eat. 
you need a place to stay. If you have a mortgage and a grocery bill, you don't actually have the choice of completely exiting the labor market. And people obviously strive for that choice and people do get pickier when they have more reserves and savings, but that's obviously a story we tell ourselves. Similarly for employers, if an employer has a factory that they've put a lot of capital into and they want to staff it, they need to make whatever debt payments they have on their capital and they need employees to do that. So in a tight labor market right now, what we're seeing with employers is I'm sure plenty would not necessarily love to deal with the current labor market, but that is something they have to contend with because they, they also don't have perfect entry and exit. Another thing it assumes is information asymmetry. So, uh, or they, they assume that there's no information asymmetry. So it means that everybody knows everything about everything else. And they, and that's sort of tied into perfect information. So the, in, the information asymmetry point is that if you are going to work for somebody, I know exactly as your employer, how good you are as an employee and you know as an employee or prospective one exactly how good I am to work for. Now, of course, both of those things you don't know, right? If you go to work for somebody, you don't know all the ins and outs of that company and you don't know if they're a reliable employer and the empl employer like similarly doesn't know how good of an employee you are. So there's information asymmetry and then there's also a lack of perfect information where we both just sort of know everything. And then a, a final point is it sort of requires, uh, to some degree, homogenous goods within this marketplace, so you can sort of substitute. And those are sort of the areas where markets fail. And if you're looking at the sort of the real world of economics and public policy, you can narrow almost everything down, in my opinion, this is, this is sort of an opinion-driven uh, discussion, to market failures. It's usually that's what we're trying to address with a lot of public policy. So let's jump right into an example of that. Let's jump into healthcare, right? Healthcare is a big issue. And so the first thing we wanna do is set up, if you think back on those five things that I talked about as the way to shape every single public policy debate, the first one was stakeholders, right? The first and the second were both public and private stakeholders. So who are some of the stakeholders in the healthcare debate and why do we care about the intersection of economics and public policy? So first off, we've got physicians and specialists, right? That's a big stakeholder group. And if you're a physician, you've spent years going to medical school, years going to undergrad, you've probably racked up a couple hundred thousand dollars in student debt. Now you're in the market for providing services, but you also, of course, want to enjoy your work. You don't want it to be too bureaucratic. You don't want to not make a return on all of your time in school, right? You wouldn't spend 10 years in school if you could make just as much money doing five years in school. So you've got sort of an incentive there. You, of course, also want to maximize the best outcomes in terms of health outcomes for your patients. Then you've got specialists. So think about your, your specialty surgeons and also your specialty operators of particular medical equipment like, MRE, or like MRIs. And that's one big stakeholder group. On the other hand, you've got nurses and nurse practitioners. And so you've got a sort of slightly less time input for, for getting into these labor markets, but still a lot of time, still a lot of expertise. And if you think about it, one of the first areas where we're gonna run into intercoalitional debates is within different specialty groups, there's a certain market for say medical procedures and two different types of surgeons might have a stakeholder fight over where the scope of their practice lies. So if you are a leg surgeon or you're a foot surgeon, who gets to operate on the ankle would be a sort of a classic example of this. Or if you are an ophthalmologist or you're an optometrist, where does the scope of practice between one or the other lie? And you end up with the same thing in nurses and nurse practitioners. If you are in a rural area where you can't get a general practitioner's doctor, can a nurse prescribe medication? Well, of course, there's a market there. And because that market is uh, shaped in part by the number of participants in it, you might have a public policy fight over the scope of practice between the two. Uh, technicians sort of falls into this, but now let's take a flip. Okay, so we've covered all the different labor market components of the healthcare market, but what about hospitals and institutions? So you might have large aggregate healthcare systems. Some of them might be uh, religious, some of them might be nonprofit, some of them might be for-profit, some of them might be owned as a co-op by the doctors, some of, them, some of them might be owned by investors. Can you just go and create a hospital? Well, in plenty of areas, you can't because incumbent hospital operators get to decide if another hospital is needed in that area. So now you've got kind of a moral hazard. And again, this sort of comes into protecting markets. Uh, on top of that, you've got insurers who are sort of another angle here in discussing the, the way that, pol that public policy 
is involved in here. So within the insurer world, you've got a different set of incentives. And this is true, you know, we, we tend to think about it in the context of the US where there's a lot of private insurance. There is, of course, public insurance in the US, the Medicare and Medicaid systems work very similar to the Canadian system, where the insurance is provided by the government, but the private with the care is delivered privately, just like in Canada. The US also has the Veterans Health Administration, which is very, very large, uh, that, you know, it covers tens of millions of people. And it operates more like the UK's National Health Service, where both the insurance and the delivery of care are both provided by the government. So the US really has three different systems within it. But within this insurer's angle, you've also got, uh, so regardless of whether or not you're providing it publicly or privately, the insurance provider is trying to limit the overall cost because they want to try and keep premiums lower for everybody who's not using healthcare. And this is the same incentive. If you're a private insurer, of course, you might have a profit angle on top of that. If it's a competitive enough market, the profit can just be sort of put off to what they can do with the float in between spending all the money. So they might still spend the exact same amount per person as a, a public insurer, but, um, and the profit might come from somewhere else, but a public insurer has the same set of incentives, right? BC has had some of these issues where if premiums are going up, the BC government has to raise the uh, medical services plan premium. I think recently in the last couple of years, Keith, you can correct me if I'm wrong, they recently rolled that into just the general income taxes, which obscures the cost potentially a little bit, but the government is still incentivized to keep that down because if people have higher income taxes, they're not gonna be happy with the government. Keith, am I remember correctly that did BC swap that over? Yes, that is correct. It is now part of just general taxes, uh, not being paid directly as a user fee. So, so that's a perfect example of a change in incentives. So it's much harder for you to now see, hey, my MSP went up. Now it's a little bit more obscured, but the government still has an incentive to not go that, to not let those premiums rise out of control because if, uh, if all of you start paying double the income tax in a couple of years, when you're sort of back on the regular labor markets, uh, you won't be happy with the government and you'll vote for somebody else. So there's still these incentives, regardless of public or private, that are very different than the incentives of the other four stakeholder groups. So now you're starting to get a picture of the asymmetry in terms of how different groups debate things. That sort of also feeds into government administration regulators who I've covered. They also have a different set of incentives, right? So you can think about this in the context of say, uh, the COVID vaccines, right? So as a pharmaceutical company, you want to get those things to market. I should just be general because it's a, it's a general trade-off. Uh, as a government administrator, you don't want to sign off on something that's not safe. So different sets of incentives. You've got medical schools, which can sort of train people and feed things in here, but similar sort of story. Can you just go start a medical school out of the blue to compete with other ones? Iffy. And then of course, you've got um, consumers, in this case, patients, who, have a, who want this whole system to work very well. But if you're a patient sitting here, look at these seven other stakeholder groups who are all sitting there with different sets of incentives and different sets of perspectives about the best thing to work. And you as a patient want good care, but it's kind of opaque what that means, right? You want in a perfect world to live forever and for it to cost you nothing. Now that's obviously not realistic. And so we're coming down from that perfect state. And then you've also got social service organizations that sort of advocate on behalf of patients. And then of course you've got employers, which is a big angle in both the US and Canada, for example, because in the US a significant amount of people get their health insurance from their employers. And for employers, that's a cost. Canadian manufacturers in some cases benefit because the cost is pushed onto the broader taxpayer group. And as a result, it gives them a competitive advantage against American manufacturers that might have to add healthcare costs on top of their overall employee costs. So that's kind of a setup for how you think about this applied world where economics and public policy are meeting, right? Economics is all about incentives and scarcity and public policy is all about the way that people negotiate and compromise with each other to align their incentives with, with what the state of being is. So do we have a perfect market in healthcare? Uh, probably not, right? If you think about pricing power, if you look at each one of these things, you end up with a lot of very localized monopolies. In the case of the US, of course, sometimes pricing is set on the market. Sometimes pricing might be set by uh, Medicare and Medicaid, which have reimbursement schedules for certain procedures. So you've got very unclear in terms of pricing. You've also got things like drug patents, which preserve pricing power for a period of time and then don't. But you've also got uh, things like perfect entry and exit also as a failure. So can you just become a doctor? No, it takes a long time. Can you just become a medical school or a hospital? No, it takes a long time. 
if you have a heart attack, can you choose to just optionally leave the healthcare market? No, you need service. You don't have the choice of saying, I don't like the price. I'm going to wait till next year. Do you have information asymmetry? Yes, absolutely. Because you as a patient don't know entirely what's even wrong with you, let alone the best course of care. As a medical provider, same sort of story. They have to try and figure it out, but they don't know what the most likely outcome is. You end up with one of the very complicating factors in doing empirical analysis of health outcomes is these selection mechanisms that come into play. So you could look at two hospitals and find that one has a much lower survival rate than the other, but maybe they're taking in harder patients. This is all stuff that's very unclear, and that ties into the perfect information as well. And what about homogenous goods? No, absolutely not. We sometimes have it in the case of, say, basic pharmaceuticals. You could say, well, the generic and the on-brand is, is uh, roughly substitutable, but otherwise, no, there's still a lot of skill. There's still a lot of knowledge that comes into play. And you still have the broad issue, even of modern drugs like biologics, you can't actually perfectly mimic them. It's much easier to make a generic for a traditional chemical compound than it is for, say, the biologics as a newer class of drugs. So healthcare, putting that all together, we've got this issue where you've got all these different stakeholder groups with all these different sets of incentives and alignment, and you have a market that is not perfect for all of those different reasons. And that is more or less how the two interact in terms of policymaking and the big fights that you see. And so right now, right now, healthcare is not really top of mind for people. Other things are sort of coming up. Every one of these debates becomes sort of popular or less popular over time as it looks like there's a push for things. The last time there was a big policy movement in the U.S. was the enactment of the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, uh, back almost a decade ago now. Um, I guess it was over a decade ago now. Oh, time flies. But that was sort of the last big movement around healthcare, and it shaped each one of these different things in their own ways. And so if you want to interpret that public policy, that would be one way. But let's pivot into it. So that's a framework that kind of explains healthcare. But what about finance and housing? So housing, we all kind of need a house. So let's jump back to our first couple of points. Who are all the stakeholders? So in the US, you've got commercial investment and retail banking who all sort of play in the, the finance and housing place. You've got things like uh, credit unions, which work a little bit differently in terms of how they're chartered and how they're set up. You've got the central bank, the Federal Reserve, which was making news this afternoon because the Fed chair, Jerome Powell, was talking about what they're going to do with interest rates, which, of course, has a big pink impact both on finance and on housing. You've got things like the regulators. So you've got FINRA, which is sort of private self-oversight of the industry. You've also got the Securities and Exchange Commission, the consumer, um, uh, the sorry, the the uh, CFTC, the FDIC, FinCEN, and the OCC. So the OCC is the Comptroller of Currency, which regulates certain aspects of that. You've got the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which regulates futures and options. You've got the Federal Deposit and Insurance Corporation, which provides deposit insurance. So you've got all these different regulators in the market, and that's not even sort of the full list. Uh, then you've got the government-sponsored enterprises, which take mortgage debt and securitize it and push it out for investors. And that hacks as a effectively as a subsidy for the market because it reduces some of the risk that an individual lender may face. You've got mortgage brokers and originators. You've got real estate buyers and sellers. And that is, of course, covering a lot of people. That might cover you if you're shopping for a mortgage. It might cover your real estate agent. It covers the whole, the whole spectrum. And when you roll all this together, that's a lot of competing different incentives, just like we saw with the issue with healthcare. So as a buyer, you of course want the lowest cost for your home. In a perfect world, the home costs you nothing and it's a big giant mansion that you can do whatever you want with. That's of course not how it actually works because economics, scarcity and incentives. So what's the interplay, for example, between all of these entities around interest rates? So that's what people are talking about right now, whether or not the Federal Reserve will raise interest rates. The Bank of Canada is going through the same sort of thing. And the reason why we care about interest rates in the case of housing, for example, is the price of a house that you buy isn't just the sticker price. One thing that uh, I would say our younger generations are kind of getting wrong is we're looking at the price of a house compared to what our parents paid and saying, this is so unfair, we're having to pay so much more. But the important thing to remember is that the price of that house isn't just the price of the house, it's also the price of the money to buy the house because you're not buying the house in cash. Almost nobody does. And 
What that means is that buying a $200,000 house, like our parents might have, at an 18% interest rate is, in some cases, a worse deal than buying a $350,000 house at a 2% interest rate. So that is one of the reasons why we care, because the long-term price of the asset is tied into the cost of the currency to buy it. So that's kind of one area of debate that's coming up. Of course, if you're a real estate agent, you want to be selling houses for as much as possible because you're making a commission off the top. If you are a bank and a credit union, you want to be originating these loans because you make a fee off of that. If you're a mortgage broker, you want a competitive market because your big benefit is that you can help people shop for that stuff. If you are a regulator, you want stability. You don't want necessarily people in houses they can't afford because if the system comes tumbling down, you get blamed for it. So this is sort of the, the overall sort of set of competing incentives among the stakeholders. Do we have a perfect market? Let's get into it. So first off, pricing power. Well, houses are very, very illiquid in some cases. And the price of a house is not something where you can sort of take it or leave it. Because if you go and buy a house and you have a bunch of debt, and then a couple of years later, you want to sell it, you have a very difficult time selling that house if it's gone down in value. So that's a big problem. If you go out and you buy a house, let's say you put 20% down, and then the price of the house drops by 30%, you can't really just liquidate it or you're gonna be on the hook for, for more money than you might have. So you end up with some weird aspects of pricing power and pricing is kind of set by the Fed in some ways because they're setting the interest rates. Do you have perfect entry and exit? No, absolutely not because houses take a while to build, nine to 10 months on average. Right now it's taking longer because the supply chains are all messed up. And on top of that, the price of a new house is gonna be a function of a, what the interest rates are, because the person who's building it had to buy the land first to build a house on top of it, but also a price of material. It's also going to be tied into the price of materials. The price of an existing house is going to be a different story. It's going to be market demand based on that area. The materials price is less relevant, but because they're substitutes, you do end up with an interplay between the price of a new house and the price of an existing house. What about information asymmetry? Well, yes, absolutely, because if you own a home and you're going to sell it, that is a Big, you know a lot more about the home than somebody who's going to buy it. Similarly, if you're going to go buy a home and the owner tells you it's perfect, they know what the true answer is. You don't. And you can try and get a home inspector and these other sorts of things to sort of level the playing field, but you certainly have information asymmetry. What about perfect information? Same story. Uh, you know, Nobody knows everything about everything else. If you're a seller and you're looking to sell and you've got two different people jumping into the market to buy, you don't know if one of them is actually good for the loan or not until it actually clears. So you end up with some uncertainty there. And of course, houses are absolutely not homogenous goods. Almost every single one is unique. It's not like uh, smartphones coming off of an assembly line. They're all kind of different. So once again, we see this interplay of stakeholders who have a different set of incentives and dealing with different sets of, of scarcity. And we have this issue of perfect markets. So that is where we run into, again, this story of of the interplay of public policy and uh, and economics. Let's jump into energy and the environment. Again, we're just running through different examples of this framework to think about things because when you're looking at either what you wanna do with your career or how you just understand things as a, as a civic participant, as a, as a person who, you know, lives in a society and wants to understand the overall political process and the policymaking process, let's see if this framework works in the case of energy and the environment. Let's jump through the stakeholders. So of course you've got energy companies who are producers. So this is people who are generating electricity in the case of uh, here, we've got a big uh, steam tank for a nuclear power plant. Uh, one of the, I don't have pictures of it unfortunately, but one of the big, uh, one of the cooler things I did when I was the state of Illinois chief economist was tour one of the state's nuclear power plants, which was pretty neat. It was, uh, it was intense. But uh, so you've got producers there. So you've got nuclear, you've got wind, you've got solar, you've got natural gas, you've got coal, you've got biofuels, you've got geothermal, you've got all these different ways of effectively spinning a magnet in a bunch of wire to generate electrons. Solar is kind of a um, exception to that, but uh, everything else that's more or less the same principle, you're just burning different things to get there. Then you've also got energy companies that act as distributors. They might be the same as the generator or they might be different. You end up with uh, more differences in the US than in Canada. In the Canada, they tend to be regulated monopolies almost uniformly. And in the US, some states, it kind of varies, tend to follow more of a competitive market system. And the rough trade-off is if you are in a regulated monopoly, 
then you're allowed to be profitable, just not that profitable. You're allowed to pay people and, uh, you know, invest in certain pieces of equipment and raise rates, but it's sort of signed off on. In the case of a more competitive market, the trade-off is some people might be super profitable, but the idea is everybody chases the profits and then they drive the overall cost down to the marginal cost, if you think about your Econ 101 story. And as a result, consumers get a better deal than if they don't have that incentive to compete like they would in a regulated monopoly. So that's kind of the trade-off. So in the US in particular, you've got different companies acting as distributors. You've also got independent system operators who manage the overall grid of different people providing energy and distribution. Then you've got, of course, unions who operate a lot of the plants. You've got manufacturers who use electricity in very high volumes. So a completely different set of incentives than a producer. A producer wants to sell that electricity for as much as possible. A manufacturer wants to buy it for as cheap as possible. And if you are a uh, state government, which we'll get to, commercial businesses, same idea as manufacturers, consumers, same idea as well. Everybody wants it at different rates, but sometimes those rates are regulated. So what is the rate that a commercial person pays and what is the, the rate that a user pays? And those things are typically regulated by utility commissions at the state level. And I imagine, I don't know for sure, but I imagine if you dig into how BC Hydro works or Fortis Gas works, they probably have different rate schedules for different types of users. And some of that could also just be volume discounts, too, that can come into play because a manufacturer is buying a lot of, uh, let's say, natural gas. Uh, but you also got local governments. So think about a local government that has a big nuclear power plant. Well, that's a lot of employment in your area. You don't want to use that. But maybe your local government that has a big manufacturing plant and they want low rates. What if your local government that has both? Your two big employers might have completely different sets of incentives. And then, of course, you've also got equipment manufacturers who might make things for the producers. So uh, General Electric might make a turbine that goes in a natural gas plant, uh, or they might be making something that goes in a manufacturing plant. So they could be on both sides of it. And then you've also got NGOs that sort of typically, the most common thing is they lobby for either environmental concern or they lobby for consumers in terms of lower rates because consumers tend to be a little less sensitive to this stuff because you're not gonna notice a 5% increase in your electric bill the same way a big company might because the company probably has a staff of people who spend things, spend their time worrying about the price of electricity. And so do we have a competitive perfect market here? Well, I think you're probably getting the theme so far of each one of these case studies. Uh, no, pricing power is absolutely not something that people can just set. Usually you have only a small handful of generators. If you are an individual on the, if you are an individual producer of energy, the prices might be set very heavily by a local regulator. And some of the times that's to address the fact that if you have a big power plant and a transmission line and then a distribution grid to houses, you want to make sure those houses are paying a fair rate because you might have signed off on only creating one, right? This is the issue of when something is so capital intensive, it's not realistic for somebody else to risk exposing themselves to market forces for something that might not be profitable. So this is where the regulation aspect comes in. Do you have perfect entry and exit? No, absolutely not. Do you have information asymmetry? Yes, of course. The idea of usage and types of generation or environmental cost would sort of fall under the perfect information framework, right? Like what is the long-term cost of uh, wind turbines in terms of people falling off of them and dying? What is the long-term cost of coal plants with regards to asthma and deaths due to uh, respiratory illnesses? What are the long-term costs of nuclear fuel and the issue of how we deal with waste, right? So there's there's all these things that we kind of don't know and are trying to figure it out. And then, of course, homogenous goods. I mean, electrons get kind of close in terms of homogenous goods, but even there, you've got this issue of reliability. And uh, more importantly, the good isn't just the electron, it's also the byproducts of generating it. And so that's where you end up with a lot of differences in terms of, well, Nuclear produces no carbon emissions, but it produces a lot of nuclear waste. Coal produces a lot of carbon emissions, but not a lot of nuclear waste, and it's also pretty cheap. Wind doesn't produce nuclear waste or coal, but it's unreliable in certain climatic uh, events. Same thing with solar. So you've got all of these different trade-offs between these things. And so let's quickly close out before we get to Q&A. We'll throw one more example of this framework about how to think about stakeholders and how to think about the interaction with market forces in terms of public policy. Let's jump into labor markets. So we're all part of one, right? You're all at school right now to hopefully make yourselves more competitive on the labor market. Some of you might start businesses and be on the other side of it as an employer. 
Uh, so let's think about it. So we've got employees, quite obviously, we've got employers, we've got contractors, right? And this is a big issue uh, with in both Canada and the US where you can either be a contractor or an employee. If you're an employee, your employer is paying payroll taxes to employ you. They're paying the government a fee to employ you. Uh, in the case of the U.S., I know the statute's a little bit better. You've got, in particular, three different uh, acts, typically, in every single state that come into play. You've got the workers' comp, you've got unemployment, and then you've got minimum wage. Those are sort of the three big things where hiring an employee, you have to qualify and satisfy all the requirements of those three different authorizing statutes in the state. You've also got labor issues with the types of incorporations, you've got platforms. So the, you know, Uber and Lyft have run into this a lot with acting as platforms, are there drivers, employees or not? You've got regulators. And so three examples in the US are the National Labor Relations Board, the National Mediation Board and the Department of Labor. Each one of those has their own authorizing statute. So the National Labor Relations Board, for example, goes back to 1935 and it looks at typical disagreements between employees and employers and sets a certain standard for if one wants to unionize or how they mitigate it, um, disputes with their employer. The National Mediation Board uh, actually comes out of the Railway Labor Act because policymakers at the time decided that it was very different to have people at a widget factory disputing something with their employer versus people at a railroad disputing something with their employer because the railroad was tied into sort of national strength and national security and could create a lot more issues. So they came up with a different set of rules for how they did that. And of course, this all comes about because of the role of unionization certainly played at the time. They're less relevant now as a labor market institution, but uh, still relevant in, in many cases. You've got employer organizations as well. So you've got organizations that represent collective employer interests. So if you are a big tech company, you might be a member of the association that lobbies for tech companies and their interests. So that's sort of a, 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 an equal aspect of it. So we've got different sets of incentives, employees, you know, you want to be able to go up there and, and charge a billion dollars an hour for your labor. Employers, of course, want you to work for free because you've got two different sets of incentives. Contractors have this role where they can make potentially a lot more if they're not tied down to a specific employer, right? So they can shop around and work for multiple employers, but then they run into this issue of exposing themselves to more taxes and fees because they have to pay payroll taxes themselves. You've got the different structure of companies and the risks that they bear in terms of how you incorporate. You've got platforms that facilitate market activity between the top four. You've got regulators who have their own sets of interests. You want to try and keep both sides happy. You don't want big strikes shutting down your rail network or your aviation network. Those things are typically not things that they want. But of course, you also want to stay relevant. You've got unions who want to collectively bargain for the rights of individual employees. And then you've got employee organizations who will collectively bargain for employers. So do we have perfect competition here? I mean, I think at this point, this is our fourth run through. You're now getting it. Pricing power. No, you, you know, individual employers in this, a lot of the time have the pricing power. So this is one of the reasons why unions formed and came into existence was to try and put individual employees more in the driver's seat in terms of setting pricing power. But a lot of the time, local employers can drive the market price for something. But of course, with the rise of either scarcer skills, so that effectively shrinks your labor market and gives you more pricing power. So if you're a brain surgeon in some area, you might be able to really set what the price for brain surgeons is. But of course, Unions also form this, and so do other professional associations, where you collectively can control the price a little bit more. Perfect entry and exit, almost nobody has that in labor markets. Like I said, on an individual employee level, you need to pay your mortgage or pay your rent, and you need to pay your grocery bill. Those things are re requirements to exist, so there's that aspect of it. But likewise, employ employers usually can't just sort of choose to shut down arbitrarily because they usually have leveraged capital and they don't want to lose market position and all sorts of other reasons. Information asymmetry is very, very common here because of all of the unknowns in terms of quality of both employees and employers. And uh, of course, homogenous goods. All of us are, are special and unique. All employers are, are different. And so, no, we're not uh, perfectly substitutable. So putting this all together before we get into Q&A, uh, the overall you know, story is one of perfect markets. That's kind of what we chase. That's what maximizes human welfare. But if we think through how does that in play, interact with public policy and policy for making in the real world? You gotta first start off by thinking about who are the stakeholders involved? What are their different sets of incentives? 
And how do they manage all of these areas where markets fail? Because market failure really, really encourages the intervention of public policy. And that is where, where most of these fights happen. So with that, uh, let's jump into some, some Q and think we got what, 15 minutes left, Keith, is that about right? Yeah, for sure. So for the Q and a, um, anybody who has questions, I definitely encourage you to take advantage of this. I think, uh, probably best if people are comfortable would be to uh, raise your hand. Uh, that is, if you notice in the bottom there, we have the uh, microphone for mute, the little camera for sharing video, and then the raise hand icon. You can do that to say, hey, I want to ask a question. And then preferably we could unmute and put the video on and actually talk face to face. If you are absolutely uncomfortable with that, well, yes, we will take questions through the chat as well, of course, but uh, I think the preference would definitely be uh, be able to see each other. So. Uh, it's, it's always fun. It's always fun seeing people. So it is. It is. That's, even uh, if you're sitting around in your pajamas, that's okay. I will not judge you for pajamas or a messy bedroom. Definitely not. So uh, let's open that up. Anybody want to start us off? There we go, Francis, to start us. Uh, let's hear from you, Francis. Hi. Howdy. Uh, yeah. Quick question. Might be a complicated one. Uh, what about a uh, guaranteed minimum income or the concept of a guaranteed minimum income? I mean, with COVID, we saw it uh, in Canada when the federal implemented the CERB uh, to give like $2,000 to everybody who lost their job temporarily with COVID. And when restrictions started to be lifted up, um, we had employers had a lot of difficulties because empl employees would not go back to work. They will get a too strong incentive to actually stay home, getting paid, or to uh, at least, or to maybe take just reduced hours. And I think we saw that also in Florida. Uh, I remember seeing some posts where uh, uh, in Florida it was a movement to have signs, uh, "Please be be nice with employees because at least they showed up for work." Uh, right. So, in terms of uh, the labor market and the idea of should we go to a minimum guaranteed income, guaranteed income or not, uh, how well, I want to hear your thought on that. How we could like uh, totally unbalance the 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 market. Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. It's very relevant. There is a couple of things going on. So the first is the administration of it. We, a lot of places used the unemployment insurance system to basically kind of structure it that way because it's already an existing way to distribute benefits. But you're right. You touched on this issue of incentives and proportional positions. And in this case, the incentives were a little, were a little wonky because it was kind of an employee versus employee misalignment of incentives. I remember right when the pandemic hit, I have some friends who have a very small company in British Columbia. So they've got 25 employees or something, 30 employees. And the pandemic just like plummeted all their sales. So they were just like, we, you know, we can't even pay vendors, right? So it's just, I'm sorry, you'll have to wait until demand picks up. And they had to lay off a bunch of people. And initially the people who were working were really, really grateful to still have their source of employment. But then when the government incentives came in, they were suddenly resentful that they weren't the ones who were, on, who were laid off because all of a sudden they had to work for the amount. Whereas like, you know, even if it's a reduction, right? Like, let's say you're still taking a pay hit. You're not getting a full re-up to your salary. Like, who among us wouldn't say, you know what, I'll take a 30% pay cut for a 100% reduction in the amount of time I've got to work. That seems like a pretty good trade-off. And so you ended up with this misalignment of incentives there uh, between different employee groups. Uh, employers, I think their overall position on it kind of differed. Some obviously found it very profitable because the government was effectively paying wages, and so they were still getting that benefit. So like the whole thing was kind of a mess. I, I think it's probably one of the reasons why we're dealing with higher than low, higher levels of inflation now, because it's, you know, it, on the one hand, inflation is very cruel, but on the other hand, it's, it's better than dealing with the alternative of the entire economy collapsing. Right. So this is like one of these, one of these trade-offs where you kind of have to mull both. Inflation is very, very cruel. Uh, it, it hurts people who don't hold assets the most. It hurts the, the wage earners and people who don't hold assets, right? So it, it is very cruel economically speaking. If you hold an asset, the asset rises with inflation. If you hold cash or you're just buying consumer goods on the market and a lot of your income, a lot of your income goes to that buying, then it can really hurt your quality of life. But is that, that's, that's probably better than having the economy collapse. So, so there's an interesting angle there. I don't know that I've got a strong opinion on, on any one of these debates, 
in terms of the overall situation with 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 um, universal sort of basic income, uh, right now the unit economics of it don't work. Compare it like the if you just sort of look at what it would cost to pay everybody some universal basic income, it would be much more than the total sort of spending of basically any government. I don't think that'll be true in the future. So I think it's an interesting debate right now. I don't think the policy fundamentals really support it right now, but I think in a couple of decades, it probably will because we'll be collectively richer in terms of buying power and productivity. So uh, is it eventually a thing? I think so, probably. Will it be a thing for the next decade or two? I don't think so. So that's kind of the only opinion I have is the feasibility of it coming in. At some stage, it becomes cheaper than all of the other various schemes we have to provide a social safety net. Just giving people a lump sum cash would be would be more effective. We're just not there yet. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I uh, just want to add to that a bit before we move on to the next question is, uh, of course, there's also many different flavors of UBI. Uh, one type that is there is, of course, just that give everybody a lump sum transfer across the board. There's other versions that are more akin to what we already face, actually, which is more of a negative income tax, where if you're below a certain income level, you get money transferred to you and it'd be kind of ramping that up. Um, to kind of, uh, Mike, I see you there, we'll get to that uh, right next. Um, another way to kind of view this is through UBI or similar kind of things, it does touch on one of the problems that Misha brought up with the labor market, which is free entry and exit. Um, if you know that you have the safety net in place, it does give that bit of power back to the laborer, the wage earner, to be able to say, yeah, you know what? I can wait to get into a different, uh, to work for a different employer. I have a bit of power in that and it makes it so you have that ability to enter and exit. But of course it's not perfect. It has its flaws as Misha brought up. Yeah, that's a good point. If you want the US specific version of it, the earned income tax credit would be the thing to Google. That is kind of the US version of the reverse income tax kind of piece where it's a, it's a relatively distortion free re-up of income on the lower end of the spectrum. The main thing you want to avoid are these uh, sometimes like the poverty traps where if your income rises to a certain level, you can hit this point where the marginal return on a dollar you earn is actually negative. And the rational thing at that point is to stop trying to earn more, right? Because you're like, oh, this earning more is actually costing me money. And so then you can end up with these local minima in the wage growth area. And that can be a big disincentive for people uh, pulling themselves out of, um, you know, a lower socioeconomic status. So ideally your system avoids those sorts of things. For sure. Uh, Mike, let's uh, move on to you there. And then I see Shin has one in the comments. We'll move on to uh, Shin after Mike. Okay. Uh, do you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah okay. okay, perfect. Uh, I saw in your um, uh, bio blurb there that you did uh, housing policy as well. And I was wondering what you think about uh, New Zealand's recent uh, uh, upzoning, basically blanket upzoning of uh, I think there are five largest cities where they've banned single family dwelling zoning. Uh, I believe now it is uh, anybody can cover their property up to 50% uh, at uh, three stories. Uh, do you think that that will help them with their overpricing uh, of their housing? And would it work somewhere like Victoria or Vancouver where uh, like there's a lot of really big lots with really big houses uh, and then just towers and there's nothing really missing middle is basically what I'm asking about or is it basically we're doomed uh, to crazy high prices because money is uh, you, the cost of inflation right now. Right. Uh, so that's a also a really good question. There's two different parts to it. So the one is will it work? Yes, I think it will work. It's, it's basic economics. You increase the supply, you will all else equal lower the price. The prices might still go up, but they'll go up at a lower rate. But the marginal cost of producing a housing unit isn't that much, right? Like you need to buy some concrete, you need to buy some rebar, you need to buy some two by fours, you need to buy some, some flooring, some OSB siding, some roof sheafing, some, some tiles, some appliances, some cabinets. We can add all that stuff up. It's pretty basic accounting. It's not that expensive. Uh, in fact, it's pretty cheap. Like you could build for like 150 grand, you could build a, a family, a very, very nice place to live. The land is scarce. The land... Scarcity, though, has an issue in that we're, we're not really scarce of land, not us or New Zealanders or anybody, the, the, but the, the land is scarce in certain areas. And this is where the trade-offs start coming into play. So will it work? Yes. Now, 
do people decide to do that trade-offs? Well, that's where public policy comes in and you sort of have to make a, a moral and a values-based judgment rather than a strictly empirical one. If Mike Bennett goes to buy a house, you're buying something that you want to live in. What, you know, how much of that buyer's right do you get to hold on to if somebody wants to go build a tower next to it, right? Like the tower will help reduce prices, it'll be good for everybody else, but it's kind of bad for you because you just bought a thing and then that thing loses its value because somebody built a tower on, you know, all like, let's take the extreme example. You buy this house that you really like and then on all four sides of you, somebody builds a 10 story high sky rise, right? So you're just stuck in this box shadow. That was good for market prices. It was pretty bad for you. Do you have a right as somebody who lives there to say, hey, what the heck? I just bought this thing. I don't want to, I don't want to pay more. Probably. But that's where, that's where you get these trade-offs, right? So you see this with areas that try and do green zones. They try and say, well, we want walkable cities. We want green zones around the side of the cities and we don't want to have urban sprawl. That makes a place much lovelier to live in. But if you limit sprawl, you really jack up the price. And that jacking up the price is actually pretty good if you already own an asset. So I'm in Denver. I bought this, this townhouse in Denver. Denver has been pretty good on zoning, right? So this is a four-story townhouse right outside of downtown. And one-story single-family houses are all being knocked down and being sold at a nice profit for people who are building higher-density pieces. But I've got a neighbor across the street who was born in that house. His grandfather built it. He's now in his like 40. So it's like three generations. He's got kids. So I guess they're on their fourth generation of people living in that house. And now he's being boxed in by all these four story high rises. So is that good for him? I mean, it's nice that the value went up, but the value might've gone up even more if the zoning hadn't changed. Now what's in my incentive would be to stop building to drive up the value of this. Whereas if they build more and more of these, the value of this thing doesn't go up. So this is where you get into these moral values where you just have to have a debate as a community. New Zealand's a small enough place that they made that Blaken idea. They've also limited uh, international buyers to, if I, if I remember correctly. So they've done a no, they've pulled a number of different policy levers. In a perfect world, those things act in conjunction with each other rather than the working against each other. But you know, public policy isn't always rational in the short term. So sometimes things do pull in opposite directions. But um, yeah, overall, I mean, the quick version is yes, it will help. Should people do it? That's a that's a debate that people have to have and make their own sets of value judgments. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I'll just paraphrase here. Uh, Shin's comment in the chat is referring to, uh, from what I can look at it here, just to summarize quickly, is subsidies to get students in to become healthcare workers and to complete their healthcare programs. Uh, given this concern that, hey, do programs like this end up creating too many healthcare workers such that we have more than the system actually needs? Did I get that right, Shin? Is that roughly what we're asking? Perfect. Yes. Cool. So uh, I'll say right off the bat, I'm not familiar with education policy, which is quite funny because I teach at a university that does a lot of education policy, but it's literally the one area of policy where I've never worked on it and don't know anything about it. So I'll own that. I've worked on a lot of areas of policy, uh, but never education policy. Now, that being said, there, right now, most people sort of agree there's a scarcity of doctors. If you go back to old policy debates like 20 years ago, the American Medical Association, which is the big advocacy group for doctors in the United States, was saying there's too many. Whether or not you've got scarcity or not, is it's an interesting question because I would like for there to be one economist in the world. That would be great for me. It would be terrible for people who want to employ economists, but it would be great, right? So if Keith, Keith and I, we were in a grad cohort of 11 people who all got our, our graduate degrees in economics at the same time, in a little tiny labor market, it would be much better if it was only one of us, right? Because we're all competing for... The, the set of employers. Now in the aggregate long term, a society is healthier just by having more workers and more competition of employees and employers and you want some economic dyna dynamism. But in the short run, these interplay of economics do come into play. So I don't think that right now in the US, for example, there is a glut of healthcare workers. I think if that was the case, healthcare wouldn't be so expensive. But if you are a healthcare worker and you've just racked up a bunch of debt to get that program, you have, you want to make sure that wages don't drop because let's say you went in to be, um, you know, a, a brain surgeon and it cost you a million dollars to get educated. And you got a million dollars in debt. Well, it would be a real bummer if the wages for brain brain surgeons dropped from $500,000 to $50,000. That would, that would be devastating, right? You'd, you'd have to declare bankruptcy and pick a different line of work. 
But on the other hand, if you can subsidize some of that cost or just get more competition in the training pipeline, so more medical schools, then you can negate some of that problem. So I think that all of these government programs are probably sort of at the margins trying to reduce some of that upfront cost for people who are jumping into these markets. Whether or not it'll work, yeah, I mean, I think it, it works at the margins. I don't think it dramatically reshapes things one way or the other. And that's because right now the issue with healthcare is twofold. One is it's fundamentally very complicated. You don't want somebody right off the street doing your brain surgery. It is actually really hard to train somebody to do that. Now, whether or not we could, in a perfect system, train somebody in seven years versus 10 years, that's interesting. But most of us wouldn't want somebody who you know had a two-week uh, certification. And the other thing is that we're dealing with some very, very morally difficult end of life issues. Right now we have a demographic curve where the people born in the sort of 30s through 60s are all sort of hitting that older period of time. For the last almost 100 years, you had a very young population. Now the population's aging. If you look at say my grandfather who was in British Columbia, he passed at 99. His last four years of life probably cost the Canadian taxpayer 10 times as much as his first 95 years of life. So what, what are those years of life worth? Like, how do you assign a value to that? What would he view as, as beneficial? What's beneficial for the system? These are like unanswerable, difficult philosophical questions. And so that's one of the reasons why healthcare is kind of, um, why the economics of it are kind of dysfunctional because it's, it's a very difficult question that we have to wrestle with as a society. So I went on a tangent there. And part of that's just to mask the fact that I don't know much about those programs. But uh, overall, I think that they're probably an at the margin improvement in terms of making sure people aren't entering the market upfront with a lot of debt and to push people into these areas. Conceivably, could you overproduce? Yeah, conceivably. I don't see that as a big risk though. Logan's Run, yes, that's right. Uh, and then whatever that ripoff version of it was years later that they made with, uh, with uh, what's his name? Uh, Justin Timberlake, but like out of time or end time, something goofy. But yeah, Logan's Run would be the classic. Or Starlight Green if you want to go dark. Oh, we went there. Uh, any other uh, any other questions from anybody else? Still have the floor open here. I have a question. Oh yeah, we have a question here in the audience. Let's uh, spin it around here. I'm, I'm just wondering what the process of policy making is, as far as like where does the you know influence of, of what you're going to focus on and spend your resources like comes from, and um, and how that the whole process works. I would say the quick answer is it's a big connected web and the impetus for something can come from anywhere. The more formal definition is, you know, we both in Canada and the United States, and I'll just speak to the American example because I know it better. The primal body is your state or federal legislative body, which both derive their respective sets of power from the constitution. So it really does kind of come back to the constitution. I actually uh, keep, keep a copy here for anybody who's curious because this is sort of the root of it. It authorizes the states and the federal government and their sets of rules and guidelines. The legislature sets what is law and it can actually spell out specifically, this is what we want something to work. Or it can say, we authorize the department of X to exist and the department of X should figure out what the right policy is. So it can do that. And then that department can come up with its own structure and its own set of rules, or those can be shaped by the, the legislative body and they will sort of set what the regulatory law is versus the statutory law and then stakeholders engage with them but of course you end up with classic issues in terms of regulatory capture so maybe maybe the congress creates an agency to go do x y or z and then the private sector entities that would benefit from that go in and shape it in a way that might not benefit public policy or maybe the public policy ignores what the private sector would want and it ends up really dysfunctional because it's not realistic. So that's why it's an interconnected web. But if you want to sort of draw the, 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 the vertical diagram formally, it starts off constitution, then the legislative body, and then the legislative body can say, this is what it should look like, or it can say, this is what the, the authorizing agency should do and they can come up with the policy. And then within there, that's when you end up with partnerships with think tanks and universities and studies and how you shape that process. Did that answer your question or was that off what you were looking for? It did. Cool. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. And, and this is if, I, if, you know, if I'm being, as a, as a British Columbian who did move to the US, I will say one of the big benefits of the US system is the fact that this is the US constitution. It's very straightforward. Uh, it is actually a pretty good way to understand things. And that is a simplifying factor relative to Canada where there isn't even a consensus about how big the constitution is, let alone what's in it. <laughs>
So that is one of the simplifying factors of the, the US system. Now it took a, a, you know, a revolutionary war to make it that simple, but that is one of the benefits. Well, exactly. Here in Canada, based off the Westminster system, we have a lot of the informal constitution just as much as we have formal constitutions. So, right. Um, any any final any final questions for Misha here? Uh, last call out. Aaron, yes. Hello. Can you guys hear me? We can. Howdy. Hi. I was just wondering what government policies can help uh, shift people out of cars and using more um, environmentally friendly modes of transportation. Sure. So I'll sidestep the normative trade off in that in that policy debate and just jump into what levers would work. Uh, the most common things that we've seen would be gas taxes, uh, transportation taxes, and then taxes on the actual vehicle itself and then registration taxes. So running through that. The U.S. has, I think, a 27 cents per gallon tax on gasoline. Most of that goes into infrastructure. The government could say tomorrow, you know, well, we're going to authorize this through Congress. We're going to raise that to two dollars a gallon and all of it's going into subsidizing bike paths and making it much more expensive to drive. Now, what you would see is some substitution into, say, electric cars then. So then what you could do is say, well, on top of that, uh, a state. So the feds can't do this, but a state could say, well, we're going to set your registration to be $10,000 to register a car to drive in the state. Or we're going to come up with like a vehicle miles traveled tax as well, because electric cars would, of course, sidestep the issue of the gasoline tax. Then on top of that, you could say, well, you could do like what Stockholm did or what some other cities have famously done, where they've said, well, to drive downtown, it's going to cost you this much more. Or you could do a dynamic pricing, which is common on a lot of the U.S. interstates now, where they have a lane that costs different amounts to drive in. And you could ride, you know, increase those things to sort of change the toll rate. So those are all those are all aspects of it. Now, separate from that, of course, there's a normative piece, which is that any sort of user fee tax is going to be highly regressive, right? So you're going to hit poor people harder on that. In the U.S., it works really well for somebody who is working like an entry level service job. They can still buy a car and drive it affordably here. That's not the case in Europe, for example, right? That's much harder for somebody in Europe to do that. There's a trade off. You're giving out more carbon emissions. But if you switch to natural gas, is it that big of a deal? Or sorry, if you're switching to uh, electric cars, is it that big of a deal that somebody's driving? You know, are we viewing the driving itself as a negative or just the carbon emissions from it? So this is where you want to get into really thinking through the normative implications of the policy and not just how you would implement it. Did that, was that, was that what you're looking for? Yeah, that was good. Thank you very much. Cool. I'd uh, just add to that, definitely for uh, those of you in micro or who have definitely uh, taken micro recently, is kind of think about the elasticities of demand for driving. And given the way that we've created our cities, uh, unfortunately, our demand for driving is extremely inelastic. So the size of the taxes, the size of those fees that would be needed in Misha's example would actually be quite drastic in order to have any substantial decrease in vehicle traffic. So. Again, that's a, right. that's a big thing to think about, which again, reiterating the point, really does not do uh, much good for kind of a vertical equity of a taxation system. It's extremely regressive in that case. Right, and, and then on top of that, you know, think about the, you know, if you're, if you're pushing people into bike paths, well, bikes aren't an option in a lot of climates. It is in Victoria, right? That's why Victoria is a desirable place to live. And it is in Vancouver as well. But uh, although Victoria is considerably sunnier than Vancouver, it, the, the microclimates between the two is actually quite stark. But in Chicago, where you have wintertime temperatures of minus 40, is it realistic to expect tens of millions of people to ride their bikes into work? Probably not. In the summer in Houston, when it is 60 degrees outside uh, Celsius, I mean, is that something that people are going to ride their bikes in? Probably not. You'd, you'd kill a lot of people that way, just from, just from exposure. And... You know, how how much per mile does it cost to build a train? It used to be pretty cheap, but now you're looking, you know, for rail at, you know, over, you can be over $100 million a kilometer in some cases to build a rail line. So it's a lot cheaper to build a road and then for people to buy their own vehicles and to drive that. And this is where you want to be really intentional about thinking through, or is your problem with the driving or with the emissions? Because those are those are two separate things. Perfect. Uh, we'll do another we'll do another call for questions Aaron that was great thank you yeah great question very relevant cool yes 
see if I can get all these things working here. I think you can hear me okay, right? Yep. Awesome. Um, so I, I think you touched on this a little bit, but my, my question specifically from uh, like a policy standpoint um, is, is uh, um, with the housing market, how, how does the housing market not end up the way that we saw it, I guess, in, in 2008, 2009, where everything went like kaboom and people were over leveraged, rates went up and then, and then people are losing their homes because they can't afford to pay their mortgage when, you know, I had two friends that recently bought homes that I know are at the maximum of what they can afford. How, how does mm -hmm. that not happen again? Uh, I, a couple I, things. Yeah. One is the down payment is different. Uh, two is there's more fixed price mortgages, right? So fewer variable mortgages. And then three, one of the things that we did with the pandemic, at least in the US, that, yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if Canada did the same thing because usually the, the policy between the two countries tends to track pretty closely. But in the US, the, uh, the first big bill that Congress passed to address it specifically said you can go into forbearance on your mortgages. So the servicers can be made right by the feds, but you as an individual mortgage holder can go a year, uh, I believe was the initial policy without having to make your mortgage payment. You just file for forbearance with your servicer and then you don't have to pay it. I wouldn't be shocked if that becomes more of a policy because of that systemic issue. But uh, the biggest thing is you just want to avoid, you want to, I mean, A, I don't think it, so the first part of your question was how will it not be that? And that is, People are putting more money in their homes and uh, they're locking in fixed rate mortgages. So that's that's the thing that will avoid it. The second thing that you didn't ask about that I think was important to keep in mind is we don't want to deviate from that. There's an incentive to get more people in homes, right? You benefit from it if you own a home of other people buying homes because it drives up the value of your home. And then you can use home equity to go and spend stuff, which everybody else likes because you're spending money on them. The government likes it because it's got all this tax revenue and it's got happy voters. So everybody is incentivized to throw as many people into houses as possible. But of course, that's what happened in the 2000s. And that's why you had a big crash is because it, it exceeded what was practically feasible in the long term. So it's more about uh, also just really protecting against those incentives and making sure that home ownership is sustainable. And one of the ways you do that is you make sure that supply continues to come online, which feeds into one of the earlier questions about, well, how do you bring supply online, right? And that's where the trade-offs come into play. On the one hand, just build more, but then you get higher density, you can get sprawl, which feeds into driving, or you can end up with people having high rises built next to their single family homes that they wanted to enjoy. Trade-offs. Awesome. Yeah, thanks uh, very much for answering that and for all your time tonight. It's been, uh, or today, it's been really interesting listening to uh, the conversation from your perspective. Thank you. Absolutely. This was, uh, this was awesome. It's always great to chat with people and uh, uh, really great questions across the board. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, I also just want to add that, yeah, one of the big differences is uh, Canada has much more stringent uh, qualification requirements for mortgages, uh, especially back in 08, 09. I mean, the U.S. was rather famous for their ninja loans. There are no income, no job or assets. Um, where, hey, you want a mortgage, here you go, here it is. Uh, in Canada, we've always had a lot more stringent qualifications and they do keep getting more and more stringent with the stress test, et cetera. Uh, the problem more seems to be, could we witness a drying up of demand? I mean, here in Victoria, where we're now witnessing million dollar townhomes, uh, median house price and for all house um, classes is now over a million dollars. It starts to get to the point of who's going to be buying, right? Uh, you're going to have a lot of churn, a lot of just uh, the existing buyers harnessing equity to repurchase, but at what point, if, at what point does that dry up? So I think that's more the Canadian concern. Yeah. And, well, and it feeds into these broader systemic things like, is it healthy for civic societies in self-governing democracies to have people not be asset holders, right? To not feel that sense of ownership, right? I, I'd venture the opinion that probably not. You probably want to have people feel a sense of ownership and, and attachment to their communities if you want people to be engaged civic citizens. If people feel like the system is rigged against them and they can never own anything and they don't have any tied down and they just basically are forced to make a steep rent price to a limited set of asset holders, that's probably not good for civic society, which is not related to any, uh, anything else. Especially, I mean, really here uh, here in Canada is locally, your local civic engagement's really tied to your property tax, right? You're only taxed locally if you own. Uh, interestingly, Victoria, City of Victoria, they uh, pushed forward a motion to begin to tax renters, um, which on the surface seems like a horrible idea. Like, what? We're just going to start taxing renters a whole bunch more? 
but really the rationale with it was to encourage engagement from the rental community for them to feel engaged in civic politics and they would if they actually had skin in the game and so that was at least the motion that brought, came forward there um, very unpopular as you can imagine uh, I guess we got one time got a bit of time for one more question if there is so uh, last call for last question if not uh, we'll close but I'll give it a second there for anyone to come forward Francis again yes last one Yeah, I was waiting to see if someone else will take the last call, but uh, if someone didn't ask a question and want to jump in, feel free, all right, because I already asked. Uh, yes, about uh, market power or pricing power. Now, since uh, Ukraine is obviously stopping exporting its grain, uh, it will technically push up the demand for grain, especially from Canada and the US, because the world supply of grain will go down. On the other side, in Canada, for many years, we had grain producers who are trying to go toward selling their grain for ethanol versus selling it for food because they can make more money out of it. Now, with the whole supply of grain, uh, global grain will be lower. Uh, and yeah, how do you think it will uh, more unbalance the pricing power uh, like that balance for like the producers versus everybody else uh, because now not only they have the choice of making more money selling it for ethanol than for grain but now they will have even more incentive to selling more price to the higher bidder uh, so yeah any thought of that because yeah grain is on everything and I mean even the, yeah. the meat we eat is produced by cattle that eats grain and everything I mean any yeah. thought on that yeah, it's one of those things that's complicated at the best of times because of a couple of things. One is it's like a core input, right? So when you look at things like, uh, you know, like iron ore or softwood lumber or grain, right? Like these core commodity inputs that are very, very substitutable, but they're also so deeply tied into an entire chain of, of economic development that they are very very important but they're also subject to, to crazy commodity swings right commodities are notoriously volatile and that's one of the reasons why food in particular why there's a, a lot of regulations already because of the best of times around like crop insurance and around weights i mean uh, canada for example has the whole um board system around certain types of agricultural products which is like an almost soviet era institution but it's it's worked for the case of of canada i think it's it's a little goofy but you know that's how, how that's how it works in canada because the idea is you shouldn't be dependent on other people for your food because nothing else matters if your population starves to death right so you need to do that right like you, you you're ideally not relying on anybody else for your national security or for your food like those are like the two big ones and then things like oil get complicated because it's like how do you run a battleship to protect yourself if you can't get oil for it so you get out of these complicated things that are true at the best of times right now when you've got you know, a massive war in Europe for the first time in 70 years, uh, it's going to complicate it and commodity prices will rise. It'll benefit Canadian producers, obviously. And, um, you know, but I wouldn't be shocked if you also sort of see the Canadian government come in and say, well, we want to keep more of that locally for, for national security reasons, because we don't want to sell all our grain before, uh, before it uh, disappears. If you look at some of the most legendary famines uh, that uh, occurred in the last century, it was because people were exporting their grain to get a nice price on the market, and they just didn't care that the poorer parts of their population starved to death. That's what happened in, um, uh, in both Ukraine and in, um, and in communist China. So, you know, that, that's one of those things that you want to be intentional about in terms of food. I don't know that I've got any other thoughts beyond just sort of that broad point that agriculture is complicated at the best of times. And right now it'll be an interesting time to watch it and how the government responds and, and how consumers respond too. Because obviously if you're a grain farmer, you want to get that good price. Uh, I like that quote. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, Mike, that's a, that's a, that's a fun one. I actually have a copy of, uh, of the Wealth of Nations and I've read the whole thing cover to cover. I don't recommend it. Read the abridged version. You don't need to read the unabridged version. It's mostly he's talking about like wheat prices at the time, which is not very interesting to a modern audience. <laughs>
Yeah, I can definitely uh, relate to that. Definitely a big version or go for the audiobook if uh, if you do. It's uh, it is Mike. It's a very hard read. <laughs> Um, awesome. Well, thanks everyone for coming out. And again, a big thank you for Misha for volunteering his time and the presentation here. As always, it was greatly appreciated by everybody and uh, greatly appreciated by our department. Uh, next time you're around, definitely let me know and uh, we'll have to get together. I definitely owe you at least a beer and probably a lunch or dinner on that as well. So. Well, that's definitely not true because, as I said at the beginning, I only got through grad school because of your knowledge of matrix algebra. But uh, yeah, it's uh, great to chat with everybody. Uh, you know, BC is still hometown. I'm still back several times a year. So next time I'm there, we can try and go grab beers. Perfect. Thanks so much, everyone. All right. Take care.